<laughs> I was kind of late, not late getting here, but the time did seem to fly today. And so I've still got my cup of tea. So I'm quite happy to have a couple more minutes just uh, before we start. If anyone else has their tea, please go ahead also. And um, yeah, for those who haven't been here before, it's a, it's a really nice group, actually. It's been quite incredible to just watch uh, the group kind of form and, and the same people coming back again and again. And um, even after my Mains retreat, which I spent in Oxford, basically in isolation, um, they were all there again at the end, which amazed me. So um, <laughs> it's a very nice group. And I think a uh, nice feeling of sort of safety and trust. And we basically usually start the Sundays with uh, half an hour or so of meditation. And then we have a little Dhamma talk, which today is supposed to be on faith in karma, putting our trust in something, you know, because where, where can we really put our trust in this world when everything's changing so quickly? So um, I'll talk a bit about that and try not to get too technical because I did spend the afternoon like really thinking and looking in the text like, okay, what does the Buddha really say about this? So it's a huge subject, but it will be just hopefully a reflection that can be a bit practical and help us bring a bit more joy and incline our minds in wholesome directions, especially during these challenging times. And then at the end, we'll have some time for uh, question and answers or just feedback, comments, questions and complaints, as Ajahn Brown always says. And if we have time, I might do some little breakout rooms. I suppose it's good to warn you now because what often happens is people think, oh, I can't do that. I don't want to talk to like a person on a screen. But I can guarantee that everybody who gives it a go and faces that little bit of resistance comes back saying, oh, it was so wonderful. You know, I haven't just been like in a group where I could just be heard and just connect with other people who are practicing for so long. So it's always a very rewarding experience. So if we get the chance, um, I'll do that. And if anybody doesn't wish to join, you can still stay. Um, because it'll only be five minutes or so, and we will all reappear on the main screen after that. But I do encourage it if, if, um, if we get to that point. And if uh, anybody has particular feedback about that, I see that Yvonne has said she loved that last time. So please do say, if that's a kind of big hit, I'll make sure I shut up in time, okay? <laughs> so I'm just having a little look at how people are going. Oh, super. Someone's been uplifted through the suttas. Frazzled, yeah, this too shall pass. I think that was the Buddha actually. Yeah, feeling anxious. Great, all right, so even though I'm still sipping my tea, if you'd like to uh, just settle back and uh, retain that sense of being here with each other. You've got the visual impression, you've got the sense of familiarity there and company there. And then taking that within. So that as you close your eyes, it's as though you're in your own little cave you're in private and yet you're in community. It's the perfect monastic setting, in fact. In Burma, we used to have these um, pagodas which were hollowed out inside so that the hollow part was the meditation hall. And my teacher would put cells around the edge of that pagoda, but inside. So you could actually sit in the room either with the other people in the middle or you could be on the outside in a small cell. So you're alone and yet you've got that beautiful energy of the pagoda and in a similar way, hopefully, we can sense into that this evening.
So just checking in with your body and really asking your body how it would like to sit rather than automatically trying to position it in the way your mind says it should be. So we can only do that by coming in contact with the sensations, the feelings in the body. Perhaps the pressure of the body on the ground, on the chair, or on your meditation cushion. Especially when we are feeling some anxiety, it can be really helpful just to establish that sense of connection with the ground. Recognizing the gravity. That allows you to really sink Imagining the earth just holding you. Receiving any tension, tightness, holding, contraction. As though your body were almost melting downward. And you might still notice that you're not quite balanced. The weights may be not distributed <clears throat> perfectly well. So if you do need to adjust your ankles or the position of your knees or thighs, make sure that the buttocks aren't pinched or pressed. Then do that as an act of care. not separate from the meditation, but part of the process of developing wholesome karma, wholesome, caring, loving intentions towards this body-mind. Noticing how the rest of your body is positioned. So that the hands can just drop into the thighs or into the lap. The shoulders can release. Perhaps rolling them a little bit back. So the shoulder blades move down the body. And even the muscles, the skin starts to hang. Finding a good position for your spine. Maybe that a very upright position helps to give you a sense of space, uplift, energy. Sometimes leaning slightly backwards is what the body needs. I even had a time during my time in Burma <clears throat> where just being slightly hunched against all the instructions was actually best to relieve some sciatic pain. So just take a few minutes to experiment with what feels good for you with how your neck is aligned and how the head just rests on this very strong and sturdy spine. You may wish to take a few deep, intentional breaths. As though to invite your mind to settle down, to arrive. Breathing in fully, 
feeling the breath swell the abdomen, inflate the lungs, perhaps holding the breath for a second or two. And then releasing, letting gravity aid in the letting go. Just enjoying two or three deep breaths in this way. Before gently allowing your breathing to return to its natural rhythm and pace. Tonight, I'd really like to encourage everybody here to just allow the mind to notice whatever it wishes to. You've all been practicing a while. You may have a particular meditation method or subject that you naturally incline to. Or you may wish to try a more open, expansive awareness. But what I'd like to encourage is to really look and focus on the way that you're aware of whatever arises. And see if you can notice a space between the knowing mind and the known. In this space is where the hindrances can arise. We might react. We're not wanting something, pushing it away resisting, contracting. Or if you experience something pleasant, you may notice a slight leaning in, trying to hold on. without condemning or judging any of these energies. See if you can just widen that space and intentionally add kindness. Gentleness. And a sense of making peace. So you were looking at all experience with the eyes of a Buddha. Understanding whatever arises is due to causes in the past.
It arises in accord with nature, not as you wish it to be. But what you can do is make good mental karma in the here and now. By responding with kindness, with letting go, with warmth, curiosity, and peace. And see what kindness means to you when you meet experience. What helps you stay present? If a very difficult, heavy emotion arises, sometimes we can just give it a little more space. You might want to broaden your awareness, expand the edges to include more of the body. Or perhaps reconnect with that sense of the ground
seeing if you can trust the process, trust in this beautiful intention to give space, be kind, be gentle to everything that arises. Invested in intention, unattached to result. And whenever you notice the mind softening, viewing things through kindly eyes, just really take in the effects of that. How does that feel? How do you recognize that was kindness? That was gentleness. That was letting go. And you allow the mind to follow that very subtle pleasantness, warmth and peace. To just rest, taking refuge in this beautiful, wholesome karma that you develop in the mind.
And allowing that to be there, even alongside any anxiety or pain, tension, perhaps feelings of loneliness, even despair. Can there be this very kind, warm energy that sees the bigger picture? understands only in this moment can you influence your life Trusting that no intention of kindness, of compassion, of non-clinging goes waste. This is the path. This is the way to freedom and release. So as we're coming close to the end of the meditation, I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to just offer yourself some loving kindness. You can do this even with your hand on your heart if it helps. Really recognizing your inner goodness. Appreciating the gift that you've offered yourself by being here this evening. And you may choose to Verbalize some wishes of loving kindness towards yourself, such as, May I be truly happy. May I be free from suffering. May I be safe and well. May I be at peace. Connecting with your most deeply felt aspiration for yourself. And just repeating this to yourself, staying connected to the feeling in your body and your heart, just for a few minutes before we end.
continuing to receive your own blessings and loving kindness. And I'll offer a little chant. Sabe Sata Sabe Pana Sabe Buddha Sabe Pugala Sabe Atabawa Pariyapana Sabaitio Sabe Purisa Sabe Ariya Sabe Anaria Sabe Dewa Sabe Manusa Sabe Rini Padika Awea Hon to Abia Paja Hon to Aniga Hon to Sukiatanam Pariyavan to Duka Munjantu Yada lada sampatito Maui gachantu Kamanaka Sadu 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 <laughs> I didn't think anyone would do it, but you did. <laughs> it's a, a little inherited ritual from um, Ajahn Brahm's monastery, for those who haven't joined us before. <laughs> he always makes a big sadhu at the end. Sadhu basically means kind of awesome. Like it's a, a way of rejoicing and saying, well done, well said, and giving ourselves a bit of a pat on the back. So. It's a nice way to end, and it means I get to see smiling faces when I open my eyes, which is great. Uh, but if you want to close your eyes and be grumpy or not look smiling, that's absolutely fine as well. Absolutely welcome, because we can't always be in a good mood. Even nuns aren't always in good moods. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I make a point of that by just sharing a little bit about how I've been feeling. So I did put a, a post on Facebook recently just to say that, yeah, I was feeling the effects of, you know, the prolonged suspension of absolutely all the activities in my little monastery. Uh, it's basically just become a little house where I stay alone, sandwiched between other lay people, which is, you know, fine. They're nice enough. I don't really see them. Um, but yeah, all this kind of sense of momentum and, you know, sometimes where this is leading to is a little bit absent for me. And I guess this was part of why I wanted to talk about faith in Kama this evening, because I think it's so important to constantly reflect on the intention being the important thing, yeah? So one of the important kind of um, principles of Buddhism and, the, and what makes it so different in a way from, um, from the way of the world is that we're not so interested in outcomes. We're not so interested in results. We're much more interested and invested in the process by which we get to those results, yeah? You can see all over the world, people who are so-called successful, who may have got results in a materialistic sense. But if they did that through harming others, through exploiting others, you know, through not paying their taxes or repealing human rights laws, can they really rest at ease? I really doubt so. I really doubt it. Whereas, you know, we just cannot measure sometimes all these beautiful kind intentions that we're generating day after day. And I have to say, I'm very glad that um, um, one of the, my few visitors in the last week is actually here this evening, I think, if she is there, um, if she's still with us. She's a doctor 
from Sri Lanka and she's working in Oxford. And this week it was lovely because she came to visit me. Um, Paul knew her from Facebook uh, and she finally got to visit and we walked and we talked a lot about the Dhamma and just to see the joy in her face and, and to really sense the sincerity of her thirst for the Dhamma and her love of the Dhamma for me it was just so um, motivating and inspiring. And she was in tears a couple of times, just, you know, moved by meeting somebody, in, a member of the Sangha. I don't take that personally, but just the fact that there are people in this world that commit their lives to the Dhamma, you know, and that there is this opportunity, like, like that there's a field of merit, which we can all be part of, whenever somebody shares the Dhamma, we can support that. And everybody here is supporting that, right? Because how can we share Dhamma? What's the point of it if nobody is even interested in the Dhamma? But it's this combined energy, you know, that really reinforces those intentions and, and means so much in the world. And I realized at that point, you know, that so much of what we do is, is almost invisible. A friend uh, phoned me up today, actually, and she told me, uh, about the concept of invisible work. And invisible work is the sort of things that happen in the background to bring forth the conditions that we inherit in a sense. So all the people that made it actually possible for us to be here today, for example, or even just, you know, the earthworms that toil the soil and aerate the soil so that other plants can grow. And then from those plants, the bees can come and pollinate the flowers and, and produce food. This is invisible work that's not noticed. And I'm sure those worms never stop to think, hey, am I appreciated or not? <laughs> they're just carrying on doing what they're doing, you know, part of this massive, incredible, miraculous ecosystem. And all these things come together and bear their fruits. So, so much of what we inherit, I mean, even for a non, Sometimes I look at the monks and I think, oh gosh, you know, they walk into a ready-made monastery, they have their enlightened teachers, they have all the support, they don't need to be on the internet and, you know, developing their own committee and dealing with sort of so many um, community concerns. So sometimes I think, gosh, you know, they've got it made because of all this, uh, this work that other people have done for 2,600 years. But if I look at my own life, the same applies, right? The lineage of bhikkhunis that went before me. My own teacher who constantly puts in that input. And one of the key teachings I received from him during the rains, because we continued with these regular interviews every week, which still continues, for which I'm incredibly grateful. Um, and one of the things he said to me was, I'm interested in process, not in result. And this was so meaningful to me because I think one of the kind of pitfalls in the sense, especially when you have a longer period of solitude is that you start measuring, you know, like one month's passed, okay, I'm getting quite peaceful now. Like, oh yeah, the joy is starting to come up. And then it's like two weeks later, oh, I seem to have gone a little bit backwards. I'm sure it was gaining momentum. What happened, you know? <laughs> because of course the path's not linear. And how can we measure by results? So when I spoke about this to Ajahn Brahm and at times, you know, I was thinking, oh, I'm going through a bit of a dip. Actually, it was never, I never got really off course. I was very contented and full of gratitude for the um, opportunity I had. But, you know, at times the mind's just a little bit flatter, a little bit more dull. And I said to him, how, you know, you seem to have confidence in me. Like he really encourages me and gives me so much time. And he said, yeah, well, I just look at the whole picture. You know, I look at the long-term practitioners and I know they're the ones that are going to make it, you know, in monastic life. They're the ones that are going to really find freedom and, and develop deep insight. It's that constant putting in of right intention, you know, day after day, as much as we can. This is the way to practice and not just to focus on short-term results. So I think this is really important as a concept. And some people, of course, even dispute the whole idea of karma, you know, that such a thing exists. But the Buddha said, you know, karma is not something like fate or destiny. It's not something that, you know, we're kind of lumped with because of things we've done in the past. Sure, there are effects 
facts that we're experiencing now because of things we've done in the past. But there are also many other reasons for what we experience. And um, a sutta that I was meaning to get my hands on today, but which eluded me, um, clearly points out, I'm pretty sure it's seven different reasons for things to arise in this moment. And only one of those is past karma, past action that we've done. Other things are things like, um, one of them's inattention actually. So it, it kind of implies like a mistake or an accident, like you trip up on a ladder. So that's not necessarily because in a past life you trip somebody else up on a ladder. You know, it's not like <laughs> eye for an eye. Um, it's a lot more subtle than that. And another cause is weather, right? So some things that happen are because of weather. And I think that's fascinating and it completely um, undermines any sort of um, unwholesome concept of things like group karma. Because I know during the tsunami, I think of 2001 tsunami, which uh, also hit Burma, but it hit Thailand very badly and also um, Indonesia. And some people were saying, well, you know, maybe those people just had some kind of bad karma as a group. But actually, the Buddha very clearly says, you know, that there are such um, things that happen because of weather. And even if, you know, they, they get the sort of um, seemingly very negative, unpleasant and unwanted consequences of that weather in this life, there are so many other causes behind that. What are we all doing about climate change? How are we contributing to that? Maybe that's actually, you know, our bad karma that's waiting to arise in the future. So it's, it's very complicated. But I wanted to use this um, situation that we're now in also, because I think that, um, you know, it's quite easy for us to start to get despondent when the external situation is, is very difficult and start wondering, you know, is it something wrong with us as a society, as a culture, or even as individuals that we're now perhaps alone or struggling or, you know, finding it difficult to be around the people in our own home or whatever other difficulties and, and maybe mental health struggles that we have. And uh, again, you know, the external conditions don't necessarily um, lead towards our happiness in the future. It's all about how we meet those conditions in the present. And so I really asked myself today, you know, what do I really want to get out of the next month? We're going into a lockdown again. We have to reset. You know, we have to kind of uh, factor in these darker nights and sometimes the dismal weather. And yeah, the fact that we can't do everything that we want to do right now. So what can we do? How can we make best use of this time? You know, where, what are you going to put your faith and your refuge in? You know, I think it's a really great time to just... Uh, look at our priorities how are we spending our time the buddha says you know the days and nights are relentlessly passing how well are we spending our time and that's something that the monastics are supposed to reflect on daily you know just seeing how quickly even during the autumn the leaves went from just starting to turn sort of slightly yellow and brown to almost completely falling off through the wind and the rain and now they're all on the ground it's just incredibly fast, you know, and it hardly seems like a moment ago that we're in the springtime. And again, we're around to another lockdown. So time is passing and yet it shouldn't make us impatient. It should really help us to just focus on the now. So the Buddha said that, you know, all of us are bound by birth, aging, sickness and death even by sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, as the saying goes. And sometimes for people, this can be very confronting and it's not something we really want to hear. But I don't take this as a negative message. It, it's not really a message that's designed to depress. It's more this reminder that we're all in this together and that, these, um, that what we're experiencing now is always present. This is the way our lives have to go. And right now it might be more obvious, it might be more evident, but in a way, I think we've had it quite well in the West. One of the things that I found really amazing about living so many years in India was that life and death was all around you. You know, it was in the streets quite literally. 
if not human beings being carried along on a funeral pyre, it was the, uh, the dogs or even the cows, you know, just kind of so poor and eating plastic bags and, you know, really struggling to eke out their survival. And um, along with that, there was a great acceptance in the Indian mentality and also a search for something else, for something higher, something they could really take refuge in. Of course, this was the land where the Buddha also began his search so many years ago, thousands of years ago, when he saw the old person, sick person and uh, dead person and the, and the recluse. Yeah. So India is a very great spiritual land and these are called the heavenly messengers. And in a sense, that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing these heavenly messages of suffering, of sickness and of death especially for those who work in the NHS or on the front lines, you know, in any kind of health service. Or maybe you even have sick relatives at home that you're caring for. And I think it's so important at these, at these times to really trust that it's that care that matters most because you can't keep anyone alive beyond their lifespan. You know, there are certain causes in the body and the mind that, you know, determine that. And it won't be when we're ready to go. When are we ever really to, ready to go? But what we can do is really care. And the Buddha also said that, you know, we're going to be parted from everything and everyone that's dear and agreeable to us. And again, I think this can really help bring an appreciation for being in people's presence right now. I saw my parents for the first time in a year uh, last week, and it was just for two days. My dad has leukemia, so we don't know, you know, how long he has. It could be that I die first. I could walk out and get run over tomorrow. Who knows? But, you know, it just made those two days so precious. And I was running around like anything, just trying to bring them cups of tea in bed and whatever I could do, you know, to serve while they were here. And it was really a, a beautiful and valuable time. And I think when we have a lot of time and we kind of assume we have a lot of time, we sometimes don't invest so much care and thought. You know, we are careless with our words or we write kind of angry emails because we're in a bad mood. <laughs> I've got a couple of those in my inbox, <laughs> but I haven't pressed send. That is um, the nun's wisdom. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting because the Buddha also says that karma has its effects and those effects can be, you know, the effects of our intentions basically can ripen um, in this life or they can ripen in a future life, or he said at any other time. And I was thinking sometimes it's really clear that these effects are ripening right now. You know, as soon as you have like a negative thought or, you know, mixed motives, and you start to notice, oh, I'm being a little bit manipulative or, you know, a bit aggressive towards somebody, you suffer then and there, right? At that moment, that is not the right intention of kindness, of uh, non-greed, non-aversion, and letting go. You've moved into the intentions based on greed, based on hatred or aversion, and based on delusion. Yeah. So the Buddha defined karma basically as intention. He said, Chaitana aham bhikkave kamam vadami, which means literally uh, volition is karma. And he addressed that to the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni sangha. So that really means that it's the quality of intention behind what then translates into actions of body, speech and mind that, the that determines um, whether we are going to be moving towards happiness in our lives, happiness, peace, compassion, loving kindness, or whether we're generating unwholesome states that are going to lead to more suffering and more misery in the world. Yeah. And the interesting part, too, is that the Buddha said that um, right view really determines and um, influences whether or not our intentions are pure. So the way we actually um, frame our experience, like the perspective that we have on life, then translates, leads into types of intentions that we generate. So he said that if we have the wrong, the wrong view, you know, the view, for example, that there is no come and there are no results of actions, or the view that, oh, there is no suffering, or there is no liberation, right? Then these kind of views will actually um, be an obstacle 
trust, having the right intention. Because if we don't believe that, you know, actions have results, then where's the incentive to take care about the seeds that we plant? There's a nice little story. I'll read that one out at least because I've got quite a few suttas that I wanted to share, but I always underestimate how much time we have. <laughs> but this one's quite nice and it's quite um, funny as well. So in the Buddha's day, there were lots of different recluses and people teaching various doctrines. And this particular person was teaching that there is no such thing as karma. And I think this is a nice, um, maybe we don't want to share that, Paul, on any of the um, <laughs> social media platforms where people dispute karma. But actually, if you did want to dispute it, this would be great. So this is called a hair blanket and it's in uh, the Anguttara Nikaya 3, number 137. And the Buddha says, because a hair blanket is declared to be the worst kind of woven garment. A hair blanket is cold in cold weather, hot in hot weather, ugly, foul smelling and uncomfortable. So too, the doctrine of Makali is declared the worst among the doctrines of the various aesthetics. The hollow man Makali teaches the doctrine in view, there is no karma, no deed and no energy. And then he gives a simile. Just as a trap set at the mouth of a river would bring about harm, suffering, calamity and disaster to many fish, so too the hollow man Makali as it were, uh, is, as it were, a trap for people who has arisen in the world for the harm, suffering, calamity and disaster of many beings. So that's pretty strong. They're pretty strong words, you know, that it's disastrous not to have some kind of right view that, you know, there is an effect of our body, speech and mind, that that has an effect for ourselves and also for those around us. Yeah. And that we can also take refuge in that because obviously the effects are very powerful when they're wholesome. So the Buddha also said there's an ending of karma and the way to end all karma is to practice the Eightfold Noble Path. So there are some kinds of karmas that lead to negative effects and so misery, suffering and harm. There are some kind of karmas that lead to positive effects in this life, to our happiness, to our well-being. And we do well to cultivate all of those. But he also said that there's the kind of karma that leads to the complete cessation of all karma. And that is the karma of practicing the Eightfold Path. Because by practicing the Eightfold Path, we actually start to purify our mind and undermine what we call the five hindrances. And the Buddha says that once those are in, undermined, we can start to practice things like jhanas or the satipatthanas yeah, and, and overcome those um, hindrances in order to lead to penetrating insight. And he says that from that place of um, insight, we're able to overcome all karma and which will mean that we don't take another birth. But until we get to that point, I did want to give a few tips for how we can actually uh, apply, you know, skillful intentions, the doctrine of karma in our everyday life. And uh, one of the really nice categories as well of, of karma that the Buddha makes is that there are five different kinds of person. He says there's one kind of person who has like, a lot of darkness in their life. So they don't have um, maybe material comfort. Um, maybe they don't have good health. They don't have a family. Perhaps they're very lonely or unwell. But that kind of person is uh, moving to brightness. So he says that even though the external conditions can be dark, there can be a person who um, is moving to brightness because they're very meticulous about um, generating pure actions of body, speech, and mind. Yeah? So they basically live a virtuous life and they're committed to, in a sense, generating good karma for the future. And then he said, there's a person that's like um, going from brightness to brightness. So that's when you already have a lot of um, happiness in your life, um, a lot of fortune that maybe you deserve or maybe it was inherited, maybe it was done by the invisible work of others but you don't take that for granted. You decide, okay, I have this brightness now, the results aren't going to last forever. So I'm going to make sure that I use these good results, the good fortune that I have for the benefit of others. 
Yeah. And that can start by recognizing the good fortune that we have, appreciating, you know, not what we don't have, but what we actually do and how we can use those resources to help other people. Then, of course, there's so what did I say? I said about the darkness going to brightness. It's all mixed up. The brightness going to brightness. So then there's the darkness going. No. So then there's the brightness going to darkness. I think this is um, quite an interesting one because you can see it in the case of, for example, people in positions of power who then misuse that power and actually create a lot of some harm and suffering for others. You know, maybe because, again, of this lack of right view, it's coming from a sense of self. It's coming from a sense of grasping, holding on, greed, you know, even hate. And certainly a lot of delusion. And then there are the people who are going from, uh, so what have I done now? <laughs> from, so that's brightness to darkness. And then brightness to brightness. I think I've done that one. But basically, okay, forget all that. What I did want to talk about is that most of us are probably a mixture of brightness and darkness, and we need to make sure we steer our ship to go towards brightness. And I think at this particular time, you know, there's a lot of darkness around, so we might sometimes feel like, oh, maybe I've done something wrong, you know, I'm not quite sure what to do. But we really um, have this resource in the Dhamma to start aligning our actions with right intention. Yeah. And we can be sure that every time we're coming from a place of kindness, a place of um, goodwill, from a place of letting go, generosity, that we are contributing to the happiness of ourselves and others. And we can experience that straight away. The other really important thing that the Buddha said was that um, uh, two other ways, two other kinds of karma are developed through wise attention. So that's Yoni So Manasikara. Right. So first we have the intentions of like non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. But then we also have this yoni so manasikara, which means wise attention. So using our minds in ways that leads to wholesome states arising and wholesome states increasing. And that avoids the unwholesome states coming in and the unwholesome states increasing. So, for example, if you want to watch something on the movies or, you know, on YouTube, noticing what effect does that have on your mind is that actually aggravating and increasing feelings of despair or agitation or loneliness or is that actually helping to open the heart in some way maybe if you've heard a very inspiring dhamma talk or even watched a movie where somebody was doing something extraordinary like i watched a documentary quite a long time ago by this incredible woman who'd um gone into a, the kind of most darkest areas in America, full of um, a lot of racism, like really quite scary stuff. And, and she was determined to meet with basically fascist Ku Klux Klan members to try and understand what was going on and, and why they had these attitudes and views. And just seeing the way she related to these people was incredibly moving because she was able to treat them with such respect that they um, started to trust her and to respect her and even take her in, even though she was a person of color, exactly the kind of person that they would have previously been, you know, very antagonistic towards, she actually changed their, their minds. And some of them started working in kind of anti-racism and, um, and really making up for, you know, the, what they'd done. And it was also interesting to see that most of these people had had some kind of trauma, as you may be able to predict, they'd had some kind of trauma in childhood, you know, some kind of abuse or maybe a lack of belonging and then getting in with the wrong crowd. So again, you can see how we're so influenced by our environment. And yet if we move into those really difficult situations with these intentions to understand, to respect, to find a different way, you know, we can actually turn things around. So sometimes you might be able to, you know, watch these kind of things, which really uplift the mind. And it's the same thing, like when we hear other people speaking as well, like what kind of speech do we want to attend to and engage in? Right. So much of the speech is negative. A lot of it is gossip, backbiting, etc. Um, do we really want to engage with that? Or can we actually use words that bring people together that unite? 
The Buddha said one aspect of right speech is to speak words that promote harmony, that are worth recording, that are pleasant to the heart, that go to the heart, I think he said. Really beautiful speech, and this is powerful. We can do this every day. Of course, I only speak mostly on Zoom sessions or on Skype calls, but sometimes I realize that I'm not speaking to myself with the same kindness that I speak to a friend with, you know. And I think this is especially important when we do maybe feel lonely. Sometimes I notice I'm feeling a bit like, oh, I'm just on my own. And then I'm not really caring for myself as I might. And then I just decide, OK, I'm going to speak to myself the way I would speak to my friend. What do you want for lunch, darling? You know, what would you really like? Not just what's quick and really easy. I have to cook for myself now because there's no one here. So I have to, you know, sometimes it's tempting to just stick a jacket potato in the microwave and, and hardly have any vegetables and just, you know, get it over with. But then when I really ask myself and I say, OK, let's put some carrot and this and that. And it feels very different. And then I eat that food with such a great sense of gratitude. You know, I'm eating the food that's been offered by so many people. And I have a responsibility to use this food, not just for health or beauty, but to practice on the path so that I can really share whatever it is that I'm learning and trying to practice with others. You know, so it has this kind of knock on effect. And I think many of us are feeling kind of stuck as well at the moment, stuck and a little bit uncertain about what's happening. And even those feelings, you know, we can either close down, become numb, kind of run around distracting ourselves from this very strange sense of being in a bit of a void. Or we can actually learn to meet these feelings with a sense of curiosity and openness. And I've been doing that recently, sometimes contacting my body and the sensations. And sometimes when there is that sense of groundlessness, there's a sense that the body's in a bit of a spin, like the sensations are very um, ethereal in a way, not very grounded. And what I notice at that time is that there's this sense of like something stuck, something very stagnant. But if I just stay with that, with complete patience, with gentleness, not wanting it to change, not wanting it to go away, then I start to see that actually there's some movement in it. It is moving. It is also impermanent, even though it may sometimes feel very stuck and contracted. It is also impermanent. And if I'm just able to open up to that with that sense of unknowing, you know, uncertainty, then something new can arise. It gives space for growth. It gives space for something new to come through. And I think this is that kind of time, you know, everything's falling, everything's sort of closing in, it's getting dark, the days are short, the leaves are falling. It's a time of kind of things dying down. But from there, the, the spring comes through. Right. So we don't know what that's going to be, but if we can just stay with that, with patience, with kindness, with trust, then I think it's, it's going in a good direction. We're doing the best we can in this moment. And again, not looking for outcomes, not looking for results. The other thing I wanted to say is about directing the mind. So that's the fifth type of um, good comer is um, directing the mind in skillful ways. So with this friend today, we were talking about prioritizing, prioritizing what's really important and finding a way to structure our day, you know, where we use the energy that we have in, for the things that matter most. You know, sometimes for me, I can end up meditating sort of a bit late and then I don't have enough energy for that. So I decided, okay, I don't really like the long days. Why don't I just start getting up much earlier and making the most of the mornings? making the most of the light, you know, maybe putting all the things that are most important right at the beginning so that by the time I have less energy, I can just slowly, slowly kind of settle down. So there are all kinds of different things, you know, you may have your own things that you can do, but um, definitely bringing up this sense of gratitude, a sense of, you know, the blessings that we do have in our lives. And um, yeah, recognizing that we can't always expect results right now results come in their own time and lastly just to close so that we do have some time for discussion i wanted to talk about metta loving kindness because this is one of the most powerful ways of generating really wholesome good karma in the here and now and there's a sutta in the anguttaras again which 
um, where the Buddha actually says that if one develops metta, say from a young age or for however long one can, and always has this lovely intention of, of loving kindness, of non-harm towards all beings, he said it's impossible for that person to do any unwholesome action, you know, to um, breach virtue, for example. They'll always act virtuously. And because of that, the suffering will be almost non-existent. He actually said there'll be no suffering in that particular sutta, but I just want to qualify that by saying that in a sense that's true because the mind is so expansive that when you're in that state of loving kindness, even if somebody abuses you or hurts you even physically, it's almost impossible to generate ill will. In fact, it would be impossible if you were in a really deep state of metta. So in that sense, you wouldn't suffer or the suffering would be extremely small. And then there's another sutta, I think it's Anguttara 3, number 100. And I, mean, I, I will say that reference because it's a brilliant sutta. But in this, the Buddha says that um, karma manifests differently according to the kind of mind it meets in the present. They're my words and not his, but this is how I understand it. So what he's saying there is that, you know, we may have done things in the past which are, you know, unskillful or that may result in, in unwholesome states of mind now. We may have regret, remorse, we may feel agitated, perhaps a relationship has failed because of that. But if your mind in this moment is full of purity, full of loving kindness and compassion, then when those results arise, it'll be like putting a salt in a huge lake you won't even notice the taste of salt that's the bad karma the simile for the bad karma but if you put that salt in a small glass of water yeah so if that bad karma arises in a mind that's already contracted and tight and full of aversion and anger then it will have a huge impact and you won't be able to drink that salty water yeah so i find this really fascinating because the Buddha said that, you know, the results of our karma will manifest at some point, whether in this life or the next, or <clears throat> if we're enlightened, of course, it will be a different matter. But the way that they arise, the way that they manifest, depends on the kind of mind that we're cultivating now. And not only that, but how we relate to them when they arise. Yeah? So we can always make peace. We can always even if you're not able to have metta towards something that's arising, you can at least just stand back, just let it come, just stay with it, try to develop some equanimity, some patience, and stay present, just let it pass. And it passes in its own time. You know, we can notice this in our practice. We can see the changing phenomena, the changing thoughts and emotions, sensations in the body, even within half an hour's meditation. So I really wanted to encourage you to, um, to put some faith and trust in, in your intentions and um, carry on generating wholesome states, bringing up the goodness of your life you know, at the beginning of your meditation. Sit down and remember what it is that you've done today that you feel happy or grateful for. Bring up your own kindness. There's nothing egotistical about that. We're looking at cause and effect. We're just looking at this kindness leads to this kind of result. So bring it up and delight in that, rejoice in that, enjoy it. Yeah. So that these intentions become something that you can really um, rest in and gain some trust and some confidence through. Yeah. So that's all for me. And I didn't manage to read out many suttas. But um, I'd like to open up for any quick comment or question, and then we'll have a little um, session where we get together in small groups, and then we'll come back again together, okay? So for those who are brave enough, please do stay. And if you have to go, that's fine. If you're not sure about the group, um, I would suggest making peace with the resistance and just going with it. But if you really don't want to, then you can stay in the main room and we'll be back in five minutes, okay? Is um, Are there any intentions that you'd like to prioritize? 
or develop more trust in? <laughs> 10 people have left. This is honestly, I trust the rest of you to stay. <laughs> Okay, I have to make Anne Marie host apparently to get the questions going. Okay, here we go. I saw a beautiful talk by um, my first teacher, Goenka, recently. He went to some kind of big, like, religious conference. I can't remember. It was probably like some NATO thing. And um, he hadn't planned to say this at all, but they asked him there about conversion. And they spoke to all these other religious leaders first about conversion. And they're all saying how they managed to convert people to their religion and this and that. And then it was his turn and he just gave this most powerful talk, not very long, but he just said, the Buddha doesn't um, talk about conversion. We're not interested in converting from one religion to another. The Buddha's interested in converting people from suffering to happiness, from bondage to liberation. It was so beautiful. It was the way he said it, you know, it's such a authority coming from the understanding of the Dhamma. It was really beautiful. I think it was a great way for me to start my practice. Just the way he presented the Dhamma as something so universal, which it is. Great, so here you are, back again. I'm getting some messages, I'm reading some messages. 